And if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 12 through 20, or there's a pew Bible in there. Uh, Jan, I'm going, to, I'm going to tattle on you if you don't mind. <laughs> we, we, were, we were talking, no, you don't have a choice. We were talking the other day, and uh, we, were, we were looking at some scripture, and both Jan and I had our phones out and our, our Bibles open. And <laughs> he said, it used to bother me when people did this, but it's so convenient. <laughs> I actually had a parent come to me one time and say, my kids, they just want to be able to read their Bible on their phones in church. I think she was afraid that people would think her kids were texting in church or something like that, you know, and uh, if they're anything like my kids, not only do they read their Bible, but they keep notes on their, uh, on their devices sometimes as well. So if you've got your smartphone, pull it up, pull out your Bible. We're going to take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. But if there are children uh, here with us today, at your discretion, I would just give you a, a content uh, warning. The, uh, the nature of this message is one on sexual immorality, and it's creeping into the church in Corinth, and it's creeping into uh, the, the church in, in America. And we're going to have some very frank discussion this morning and, and talk about some difficult things. And so uh, before we just dive into things, I want you all to be aware of that. Let's, uh, let's ask God's work in our hearts as we come to his word. Father, that is what we come before you now to ask. Lord, as we have seen in 1 Corinthians, we, we know and are clear already that apart from the work of your spirit in our life, the truth of your word is unknowable to us. The, the truths taught about you and the morality uh, taught of, of who we're supposed to be, Lord, and, and the assault on our pride as sinners is things that does not resonate well with us if we are, if we are not saved and if we have not had our hearts renewed by you and, and been born again. And so, God, we need your spirit to teach our spirits things that were previously unknowable to us. And so we ask um, that you would make us willing to yield to that work of the Spirit in our lives. Lord, give us soft hearts. Give us vigilant attitudes. Give us transparency among each other. Uh, and let us as a, as a church be a holy uh, place for you to dwell. And so we ask your blessing on this time and on the preaching of your word. And we ask it for the good of your church and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, follow along as I read these verses. Paul said, well, before I do that, let me just say this because we have so many guests today. As, as you can see, we're going through a series called Easily Entangled. And, and part of what we're looking at here is the nature of the church in Corinth and the nature of the church in the U.S. Uh, the church in Corinth was so... Um, entrenched in the sins of the world that it had brought into the church that just had carried over that oftentimes they didn't even know some of the differences. The first part of the, the book of Corinthians and, and what we first Corinthians anyways that we've already looked at is a, a big address on division in the church. In fact, it seems to be Paul's primary concern of their sins. But now starting with uh, the beginning of verse five, he's, he's addressing things, sins that have been reported to him. He's, he's addressed sexual immorality once already, but more than addressing sexual immorality, he was addressing the unwillingness of the body to correct such gross sin that was going on in the church. Then he goes to lawsuits against believers, and really, his point there is not so much about lawsuits, though that was a problem, but about the attitude of believers towards uh, each other. And now he returns to the, the destructive nature of of sexual immorality, and it had crept into the church to such a point that there became a widespread verb in the Greek language that was to Corinthianize, and, and what it literally meant was to sleep with a prostitute. The nature of the, of the church, not just the church, but the, the, the people, the community in Corinth was such that to Corinthianize was to join oneself with a prostitute. Uh, apparently, it's at the Lamberts at 6.30. Um, my wife just responded to me, so I'll edit that out before she listens to the sermon since she's out of town uh, this weekend. But, but we live in, a, we live in a, a, a society today that has allowed some of the same lies to creep into the church. 
And actually, I made a list of some of the lies of the world that I'm not accusing us as a church uh, of having these things creep in, but I, I, am, uh, I am accusing uh, the church, I am, I am saying that this is the, the state of America, and if we're not careful, these can easily creep into our lives as well, and they are creeping into some. One I've talked about recently, here's a lie that, our, that the world buys into, that the primary purpose of marriage is love. Now, I, I, notice that I say the primary purpose of marriage. I don't think that, I'm not trying to, to lower the standard that we place on love in a marriage, but we must remember what the first command to Adam and Eve was. And it was not to love each other. It was to subdue the earth and fill it. We've lost um, an article that I already mentioned that I have read uh, on a study done among churched young people is that part of the reason that they are so comfortable with the idea of God being approving of a homosexual relationship is because the church has ceased to place importance on the value of procreation in marriage. When we reduce marriage to being that uh, whose primary purpose is love, then it doesn't matter if a man loves a man or a woman loves a woman. As long as they're only loving one man or one woman, it must be okay. The problem is, that's not God's design for marriage. And that sin is creeping into the church. Interestingly enough, the normative command towards men is to love their wives. And I think if we're honest as men, most of us would say that when we consider what it means biblically to love our wives, that's something we struggle with. The normative command to women is not to love, but to respect. See, I think part of the problem is we tend to give what we want, hoping our spouse will give what we want them to. Wives tend to give love better than husbands, and they desire love in return. But as men, it's often easier to give respect when love should be given, and vice versa. The normative commands of Scripture towards men are to love their wives in a self-sacrificing way, in a way that presents our wives to God as Christ presented the church to God, holy and blameless. Here's another one. Sex is a biological appetite to be fulfilled, like eating or breathing. Maroon 5 song, Animals. If you don't know it, don't look it up. If you know it, you'll know what I'm talking about. That sex is just reduced to primal urge. It's just a need to be met. And it doesn't matter who uh, we, we meet that need with. This is a lie that has crept into the church unfortunately. Here's one. It's becoming less and less common both in the church and in the world, but it's still a lie that's out there. Pornography is not harmful. It's helpful, in fact. I, I kid you not, um, I know a guy who wrote a book, a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, and the, the book was, I knew him, uh, I was acquainted with him when he was writing the book, and, and they would, the, the publisher would not allow him to to give the book the title that he wanted to. It was a book written to young men and women, teenagers, on masturbation and its value, believe it or not. The title, I hesitated to, to say this, but I'm going to share it because this is from a seminary professor. His proposed title for the book was Getting a Grip on a Heart Issue. And um, his argument was that masturbation uh, stifles lust and that lust is sin and therefore it was a positive thing. Pretty problematic when, when our, our, our young men who are going to be trained to be in the ministry are being trained by people with such flippant views of sex and sexuality. And another big one is that marriage is disposable. Vows are being changed to, so as long as our love shall last. We have TV shows like The Starter Wife. 
people, counselors are actually recommending that young women, men and women, marry with the intention of the marriage not lasting, simply to learn from it. And then, after the first marriage and spouse is disposed of, to then marry and have a lifelong relationship with that purpose. Or with that person, rather. It's pretty sad. Read along with me as in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, for me but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immor immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never! Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. I'm just gonna admit uh, right here, right now, particularly for those of you who like to read commentaries, uh, I stole my outline today. I have no shame in doing so. Uh, I struggled with this passage and how to outline it, and uh, this one was brilliant. And the guy who, who did it, I find him to be brilliant often in his outlines. So if you're reading a commentary at some point or listening to a sermon online and you go, that sounds familiar, don't be surprised. But today, in this passage, we're going to look at three clear principles whilst, why sexual sin should be left out of the church. Three clear principles why sexual, sin, why sexual sin should be left outside the church, even though we have freedom in Christ. And the first principle is this. Sexual sin is harmful. We do have an outline up there. I didn't have an outline to Connie in time to get in the bulletin, but, but you can follow along, and the outline is pretty simple. Sexual sin is harmful. Look at the first thing Paul says here in this. He says, all things are lawful for me. I can do anything. The law has been fulfilled, but not all things are helpful. In other words, all sin can be forgiven, but at what cost? And he'll get into the cost that was paid for our forgiveness. Keep a finger in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and turn with me to Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs being written by Solomon to his son, the wisest man in the world, the wisest man ever. Having been given that wisdom by God, we're going to fly through this because we're going to look at a lot here. Start with me at the beginning of uh, Proverbs chapter 5. Solomon says, my son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may keep discretion and your lips may guard knowledge. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander and she does not know it. Now before we go on and before I make some of the statements I'm going to make, I would like to, to make a little bit of a disclaimer here. This is it, we often see in the culture of the Old Testament that when it came to sexual immorality, women were found guilty and men were just men. Solomon is not advocating that here. I'm sure the language would be reversed if he were to be addressing his daughter. But he's not. He's addressing his son. And if we couple what Solomon says here in Proverbs with what James tells us later, that the problem in, when, when temptation arises is not a problem with the thing that we're being tempted by, it's a problem in our own heart when our own hearts draw and entice us to sin. So though this is being written from the perspective of, of a man to a woman, 
Women are not the problem inherently. And that's an important foundation to lay. What is he saying here when he says that, that her lips drip honey, her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end it's bitter as wormwood? What you see is not always what you get. Verse seven, and now, O sons, listen to me and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. This makes a whole lot of sense, right? Flee, run, go away, get out of there. The trick is not to be strong. The trick is to understand you're not and run lest you give your honor to others and your, and your years to the merciless. Lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. Foreigner here just means not a, not a foreign woman as far as nationality, but one that is not your own. How many people have been wrecked by paying alimony to multiple women who are broke because their labor goes out of their house to a foreigner? And at the end of your life, you groan when your flesh and your body are consumed. And you say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I'm at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Here it is. Drink water from your own cistern. Flowing water from your own well. Should your, streams be, or should your springs be scattered abroad? Streams of water in the streets? Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. 2,000 years, maybe less, but ish, after this was written, chapters and verses were added. Solomon's son would not have stopped at chapter 5 and said, that sounds good. No, he would have gone on. My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, have given your pledge for a stranger, if you are snared in the words of your mouth, caught in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, and save yourself. For you have come into the hand of your neighbor. Go, hasten, and plead urgently with your neighbor. Give your eyes no sleep and your eyelids no slumber. Save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Go to the Anto sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. A worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech, winks with his eyes, signals with his feet, points with his fingers. In other words, what he says and what he does are two different things with perverted heart devises evil continually sowing discord therefore calamity will come upon him suddenly in a moment he will be broken beyond healing there are six things that the lord hates seven that are an abomination to him haughty eyes a lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood a heart that devises wicked plans feet that make haste to run evil a false witness who breathes out lies and one who sows discord among brothers my son, keep your father's commandments and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk with you. If you're a teenager in this room, what the wisest man in history is saying is, your parents have something to offer you. Listen to them. If you're a teenager, you can now be dismissed. That's it. Message is done for you. I'm just kidding. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light and the reproofs of discipline are the ways of life to preserve you from, wow, the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty in your heart and do not let her capture you with eyelashes for the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread but a married woman hunts down a precious life. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? 
Or can you walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he is hungry. But if he is caught, he will pay sevenfold. He will give all the goods of his house. He who commits adultery lacks sense. In other words, it's stupid. He who does it destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor, and his disgrace will not be wiped away. For jealousy makes a man furious, and he will not, and he will not spare when he takes revenge. He will accept no compensation. He will refuse, though you multiply gifts. My son, keep my words. How many times has he now said that? I think this is the fourth. And treasure up my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablets of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call insight your intimate friend to keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. For at the window of my house I have looked out through my lattice, and I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths, a man lacking sense. In other words, a stupid man. Passing along the streets near her corner. What was the principle going way back to chapter 5? Flee. Stupid people go near temptation. Taking the road to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, I literally know a story of a guy who fell into gross sexual sin and, 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 and destroyed his life and destroyed his marriage. And you know where it started? He drove by the workplace and the house of a woman to look at her, just to see her walking in and out. Along her street corner, he took the road to her house in the twilight and in the evening and at the time of night and darkness. And behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and in every corner, she lies in wait. She seizes him and kisses him. And with bold face, she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows. So now I have come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from... Colored linens from Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with loves, love. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. At full moon, he will come home. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her as an... Here it is. Listen to this. As an ox goes to the slaughter... Literally, I slaughtered a pig last week. We put a bowl of food in front of him and then shot him in the head. Let that be a picture of this. All at once, he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver as a bird rushes into a snare. He does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O sons, listen to me and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her path. For many a victim she has laid low, and all all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chamber of death. Anybody remember how many wives and concubines Solomon had? You think he is not speaking from experience? I think he is. Yes, but, but Logan, uh, there's no specific command in the Old Testament stating that, that a, a man should only marry one woman. You're right, there's not. But I have a challenge for you. Read through the Old Testament and find me a single solitary example where a man married more than one woman and it went well for him. (laughs) It's not there. It's not what God designed. God did not make Adam helpers. He made him a helper suitable to him. Sexual sin is harmful. I won't read it to you now. Write down Psalm 51. Read it 
and see if you feel like David's sin with Bathsheba brought him joy. It cost him his family. Number two, second principle why sexual sin should be left out of the church. Sexual sin is controlling. Sexual sin is controlling. Look at the second half of this verse. Paul repeats himself. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. If you turn with me to 1 Corinthians, or I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's look at verses 1 through 8. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body. Notice how these are opposites. They're antithetical. Either you're in control of your own body or you're out of control in sexual immorality, in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgresses and wrongs his brother in the, this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warn. For God has not called us, for God has not called us for impurity but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Sexual sin is controlling because where does it end? Think of the first time you held somebody's hand. How long did it last? How long was it exciting? Until something else. Think of your first kiss. Maybe just a peck. How long was that thrilling? It goes further and further and further, and every little step becomes more, something we're more and more comfortable with. Once it starts, it doesn't long satisfy. I have something I want to read you. This is, this is interesting. Ted Bundy was... Uh, a serial killer, as most of us know. But if you look at a list of serial killers who have the most victims, he is the, 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 uh, the American, I'm going to define it to that, the American serial killer who killed more than anybody else. What kind of home do you su suspect he grew up in? What do you think were the events of his childhood that led him to, to becoming a serial killer? Well, before he was executed, uh, there, were, there were people lined up to interview him. But he requested one interview with James Dobson, the founder of Focus on the Family. And, and this is a transcript. It's redacted in parts by me. I'm only going to read you the part that, that I think is important. But, but here's where it starts. This is uh, Dr. Dobson. It's about 2.30 in the afternoon. You are scheduled to be executed tomorrow morning at 7 if you don't receive another stay. It's just the context of it. What is going through your mind? What thoughts have you had in these last few days? He, he talks about how it's difficult to think about. He says this, uh, Dobson says this, For the record, you are guilty of killing many women and girls. Ted says, yes, that's true. Dobson how did it happen? Take me back. What are the antecedents of the behavior that we've seen? You were raised in what you consider to be a healthy home. You were not physically, sexually, or emotionally abused. Ted Bundy. No. And that's the tragedy of this whole situation. I grew up in a wonderful home with two dedicated and loving parents as one of five brothers and sisters. We as children were the focus of my parents' lives. We regularly attended church. My parents did not drink or smoke or gamble. There was no physical abuse or fighting in the home. I'm not saying it was leave it to beaver, but it was fine. Solid Christian home. I hope no one will try and take the easy way out of this and accuse my family of contributing to this. 
I know, and I'm trying to tell you as honestly as I know how, what happened. As a young boy of 12 or 13, I encountered outside the home in the local grocery and drug stores, softcore pornography. Young boys explore the sideways and byways of their neighborhoods, and in our neighborhood, people would dump the garbage. From time to time, we would come across books of a harder nature, more graphic. This also included detective magazines, etc., and I want to emphasize this. The discussion goes further, but Dr. Dobson comes back to this question. It fueled your fantasies. In the beginning, it fuels this kind of thought process. Then at a certain time, here's the progression. Listen to this. Then at a certain time, it is instrumental in crystallizing it, making it into something that is almost a separate entity inside Dr. Dobson, you had gone about as far as you could go in your own fantasy life with printed material, photos, videos, etc. And then there was an urge to take that step over to a physical event. Ted Bundy. Once you become addicted to it, and I look at this as a kind of addiction, you look for more potent, more explicit, more graphic kinds of material. Like an addiction, you keep craving something which is harder, and it gives you a greater sense of excitement until you reach the point where the pornography only goes so far. That jumping off point where you begin to think maybe actually doing it will give you that which is just beyond reading about it and looking at it. Now, I'm not here to say that anybody who's looked at pornography or gone along the road to some woman's house is going to become a serial killer. But what Bundy is telling us is that he would take a step and it became comfortable. It was no longer thrilling. Whether it be pornography or an extramarital affair or if you're not married, fornication, prostitutes, whatever the case may be, is there not at some point a thrill involved? An excitement. We blame others. My wife is no longer exciting. Therefore, I had to get it somewhere else. What a lie. What an absolute lie. And how long does it take before driving by her house or her workplace or turning on the TV or the computer no longer is thrilling? It doesn't take long. He goes on, Bundy, to talk about what, uh, what led to his actual first act of violence where for two years he struggled with the morals he was taught that he says he was taught in church and at home. And, and knowing that what he was driven to do was wrong, two years he fought it, but then eventually he lost the, the battle and, and went into this violent, these violent actions. Dr. Dobson, after talking about this first instance, said, would it be accurate to call that a sexual frenzy? Bundy, that's one way to describe it, a compulsion, a building up of this destructive energy. Another fact I haven't mentioned is the use of alcohol. Here it is, listen to this. In conjunction with my exposure to pornography, alcohol reduced my inhibitions and pornography eroded them further. Dr. Dobson, after you committed your first murder, what was the emotional effect? What happened in the days after that? Bundy, after all these years later, it's difficult to talk about. Reliving it through talking about it is difficult to say the least, but I want you to understand what happened. It was like coming out of some horrible trance or dream. I can only liken it to, and I don't want to over-dramatize it, being possessed by something so awful and alien, and the next morning waking up and remembering what had happened and realizing that in the eyes of the law, and certainly into the, uh, in the eyes of God, you're responsible. To wake up in the morning and realize what I had done with a clear mind, with all my essential moral and ethical feelings intact, absolutely horrified me. Dobson, you hadn't known you were capable of that before? Here we're getting to the part. The, the rest of this is backstory, building. Listen to this. There is no way to describe the brutal urge to do that. And once it has been satisfied or spent and that energy level receives, recedes, I became myself again. Basically, I was a normal person. I wasn't some guy hanging out in bars or a bum. I wasn't a pervert in the sense that people looked at someone and say, I know there's something wrong with him. I was a normal person. I had good friends. I led a normal life, except for this one small 
but very potent and destructive segment that I kept very secret and close to myself. Those of us who have been so influenced by violence in the media, particularly pornographic violence, are not some kind of inherent monsters. We are your sons and husbands. We grew up in regular families. Pornography can reach in and snatch a kid out of any house today. It snatched me out of my home 20 or 30 years ago. As diligent as my parents were, and they were diligent in protecting their children, and as a good Christian home as we had, there is no protection against the kind of influences that are loose in a society that tolerates. And he didn't finish that sentence. Dr. Dobson Outside these walls, there are several hundred reporters that want to talk to you. And you asked me to come because you had something you wanted to say. You feel that hardcore pornography and the door to it, softcore pornography, is doing untold damage to other people and causing other women to be abused and killed the way you did. This is the last of what I'm going to read. Pay attention closely. I'm no social scientist. And I don't pretend to believe that John Q. Citizen, what John Q. Citizen thinks about this. Here it is. But I've lived in prison for a long time now. And I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence. Without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography. Deeply consumed by the addiction. His request the night before his death was to meet with a prominent evangelical leader to, to explain to him the serious problem of soft core pornography. How many of you have Netflix in your home? Hulu. I do. You know when those things get rated? that they're not rated by the same standards as public television? It might say TVMA on it, but it's playing by a whole different set of rules. Our homes are wide open to softcore pornography, and sexual sin is controlling. Thirdly, sexual sin perverts the body. Verses 13 through 20. We're going to look now at three designs of the body that get perverted by sin. Let's read this section together first. Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food. And otherwise, it's just a natural urge. Our stomachs were meant for food. We eat food, it goes into the stomach. There is no other process for which it is involved other than digesting food. And the stomach for food. So that's what food was made for, and that's what the stomach was made for. Sex is just the same. Can you insert the same language here? Sex is meant for the body, and the body for sex. Would any of us sitting here today agree with that statement? Of course not. Our bodies were not just singularly designed for sex. They were designed for much more than that. What is it? He goes on to tell us. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. The first thing is that our bodies are for the Lord. Our bodies are not just simply biological structures that, that go on and have urges and desires and they're met and that's it. No, that's not, that's not it at all. 
the animal, we might look at animals and say that. Why aren't the same rules applied to the animals? If we let the, fa- if we let the false doctrine of, of uh, evolution creep into the church, it might be easy for us as Christians to say, well, we're just an extension of that. That's the process God used to bring us here. It's fine for animals. Why isn't it fine for us? God did not create man in his image out of a process of death before death entered the world from beings that were not created in his image. The difference is animals were not made in the image of glory in God nor to have a relationship with God. They were made for us, for food and and for other things. But our bodies were not just simply made for sex and we can't substitute sex for food in this statement like they were doing in Corinth, like the world wants to do and like is so quickly creeping into the church. Our bodies were made for the Lord to be his dwelling place, to be a temple for him. Secondly, the body is a member of Christ. Look at verses 15 through 18. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make the members of a prostitute? Who of us would say with any reason that if Christ were here in the flesh, still today, that we would walk up to Jesus with our Jesus is my homeboy shirt on and say, hey, let's go find a prostitute. But we're willing to turn on the computer. We're willing to turn on the TV. We're willing to pick up the magazine. We're willing to ultimately get in bed with another woman. And we're asking Jesus, hey, come along. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? This is the commandment from the beginning, that you shall leave your father and mother and cling to your wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And Paul, in Ephesians, which I think is where we're going to go after 1 Corinthians, talks at length about Christ and the church. Look up Ask Pastor John. And look up, just under there, type in sex or sexual metaphors. He has an ask, there's an Ask Pastor John on why the church is so afraid of sexual metaphors. And he talks about how we shouldn't be. How as a husband and a wife delight in each other and have pleasure with each other. And that pleasure is intense and good. That sex ought to be seen as a picture of Christ's delight in his church and the church's delight in him. How can we paint that picture to the world, to ourselves, to our spouse, to our children, to each other, if we're living in ways that are so bad for us? And we take Christ with us. My youth pastor used to say this all the time when I was growing up. Somebody talked about a movie that they had seen or something like that, and he, he, would, he would say, you realize you brought Jesus with you to watch that? That thought never left my mind. What is it that I'm asking Jesus to watch, to partake in, to be joined to? As it is written, the two shall become one flesh. Sexual sin unites Christ to the sin that you participate in. And here's, here's a, a difficult thing. Look at this. Verse 17, but he was joined to the Lord, becomes one spirit with him. We get that. We're joined. We're one with the Lord. We're going to celebrate that oneness as we partake of the Lord's table today. But then we go and we we partake in other things and we ask Jesus to come along with us in that. Verse, Verse 18, flee, there's the word again, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. It's a difficult thing to understand, but the best way I can think to put it is that all other sins are superficial compared to the deep reaching sin of sexual immorality. I was talking to somebody about this uh, just last night and the, the statement was, well, some have referred to pornography and sexual sin as an addiction and the most difficult addiction to break. Would you concur with that? I said, I don't know. 
I don't know that the person who struggles to release himself from pornography has a greater struggle than the person who strives to release himself from meth. But I will tell you this, that if you were to bring me two people, one who had been addicted to sexual sin, to pornography or something along those lines, and had been free from it without falling back into it for 10 years, and a meth addict who had been free from meth for 10 years, I would guarantee you that the daily struggle and the deep internal lasting effects of the person addicted to sexual sin is haunting and plaguing them more today than the person who had done meth 10 years ago. It is a deeply rooted sin. It is not accidental that Ted Bundy, when he wanted to talk to James Dobson, didn't talk about how to not become a serial killer or how to not become violent or commit violent crimes. The one message that he wanted to get out was protect yourself from sexual sin. It will rot you from the inside out. Thirdly, the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? What do you think of when you think of God's dwelling place? When you look forward to heaven, do you see the throne room of God as cheap, unimportant, ugly, not valuable? Read about Solomon's temple. I think an argument could be made that it was probably the most valuable, if you consider for inflation, most valuable structure ever built. Opulent. Why? Because it was the dwelling place of God. You know why this pulpit and the doors and and, and, and even the, the... trays that we're going to use today aren't covered with gold and why we haven't sought the best craftsmen from around the world to make this building the most opulent place it can be because this building is not the dwelling place of God. You and I are. The building simply is a place to stay warm while we work on our temple to stay dry while we work on our temple to have a place to gather while we work on our temple our body, our holiness. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Here it is. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. What price? The precious price of the infinitely valuable blood of Jesus Christ. So, Glorify God in your body. I want to read you something. I read it to you before. Uh, and this is uh, out of a commentary on 1 Corinthians by Kenneth Chafin. And it was something we looked at in, in chapter 5. But I feel like it's so much more valuable even now after having studied this passage. Here's what he says. The problem within the Corinthian church was how to resist the pressure of conforming to an immoral society. After all, they had only recently been part of that world and they, bought into the, and they brought into the church deeply ingrained habits of thought and action which stood in, in stark contrast with the ideals that God had for them in their new relationship with him. In addition, they were being asked to live the Christian life not in some remote and isolated colony of Christians, but in a world and culture that took a very casual attitude towards sexual morality. How to live a moral life in an immoral world is a constantly recurring problem for Christians. There is no no antique issue but one with which every church and each Christian needs help in today's world. While biblical faith views of sex as the gift of God which can bring happiness and fulfillment within the marriage relationship, there are many in our secular society that treat sex as no more than a physical appetite to be satisfied. This attitude, wherever it is found, expresses itself in relationships that are casual, casual, temporary, physical, and self-fulfilling, in contrast to the biblical mode. 
This casual attitude towards sex has infiltrated television, movies, magazines, and even our conversations during coffee break. It is the very atmosphere in which we live our lives and we are more affected by it than we realize. This commentary, written more than 20 years ago, goes on to say, this is the house of God, the assembly of God, which is the church of the living God in this present age of grace, and holiness becomes God's house. He dwells in his church, that is, in the assembly of his saints, and therefore it must be a holy assembly. That is why again and again in the New Testament we are exhorted to absolute separation from the world and its ways. So what are our next steps? What do we do with this? Step number one. This is obvious. Flee. Flee. This is what Joseph did. Potiphar's wife. Her her lips were dripping with honey. And she reached out to seize him. And he ran so fast, he left his coat right in her hands. Joseph was a smart guy. Flee. Don't try to be strong. Don't don't walk close to fire. You don't have to touch fire to get burned. You can't carry fire close to your breast and expect not to get scorched. Don't try and be strong. Flee. Stay far away. Secondly, have accountability. Open yourself up to others. Be honest with them about the struggle and, 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 and answer to them. What's worse? To have to admit your failure and seek accountability or to let yourself be destroyed? I'll tell you about a product that I literally just ordered and am excited to get. It's called Circle. Circle with Disney. Disney partnered to help Circle make this. It uh, it. it pairs with your wireless router in your home and it monitors devices. You can set time limits. You can tell your kids 30 minutes of social media a day and then social media goes bye-bye. You can tell your kids they get certain amount of time limits on games, individual apps. You can set content. You can, from your smartphone, pause the internet in your house. Devices go bye-bye. You can set a bedtime where they cannot access anything on the internet from one time till the next. In my house, we have a charging station downstairs. Our kids are not allowed to take their cell phones upstairs. I could have a bedtime for the wireless in our home that they can access, and they can take their phone upstairs, and they can uh, go to bed and use their phone as an alarm without ha- or read on. They often read without having any worry. For an extra, t- it's 99 bucks, and, and there's no service to subscribe to after that. But for an extra 10 bucks, it will monitor your kid's phone when it's not on your home wireless network, and anywhere they go, the time limits are ineffective. I'm thinking this might be the best 10 bucks a month I've ever spent. (laughs) I can't filter Netflix very well. Don't have to worry about it anymore. Circle will do it for me. It plugs right into your wireless router. Well, what happens when your kid (laughs) unplugs? It's got a battery inside. (laughs) It's pretty awesome. One of my kids last night said, why don't you trust us? I said, the fact that you have a cell phone at all is evidence that I do trust you. But two reasons why I'll answer that question. I don't trust the world around you, number one. And I don't underestimate the sin in your heart. You've not given me any reason not to distrust you so far. In fact, my my kids have given me great reason to trust them. But I still desire to protect them from what might be stumbled upon accidentally. So go order a circle with Disney. (laughs) Or wait till next week and I'll tell you how it works. If my kids come in really frustrated, you'll know it's working great. (laughs) Number three, serve the church. Turn with me to Galatians 5. I'll try and land this plane here quickly. (laughs) Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. What's Paul's formula for not giving your own flesh an an opportunity? Serve people. 
For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Fill your time serving people and don't give your, op- your flesh an opportunity. Idle hands are the devil's playground. Really. Number four, walk by the Spirit. Uh, verse f- uh, 16, as we continue on in Galatians 5. But I say... Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Not that these sins are unforgivable, but that the one who lives in these sins is probably not forgiven. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 1 Thessalonians 4. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ, who have been bought by his precious blood, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Howard Hendricks said that dusty Bibles always lead to dirty lives. How do we walk by the flesh? We live in this book. It is not the only spiritual discipline to exercise, but it is the most important spiritual discipline that you can put in your life. Because every other discipline and everything else God calls us to do is informed by this book. Dusty Bibles always lead to dirty lives. Father, make us a holy temple fitting for the dwelling of your spirit. God, let us understand that to love our wives is to love ourselves. Make us satisfied in the breasts of the wives of our youth. Let let sex within the bounds of marriage in a holy way be a picture of our delight in you and union with you and of your delight in us. God, teach us as a church how and give us strength to live with your morals in a world that is quickly abandoning those morals and is demanding that we do the same. Teach us how to stand firmly and strongly on your word. Make us people of the book that we might walk by your spirit. And Father, as we come now to your table. I pray that you would remind us of the precious blood that was spent to purchase us. Let us think with great gravity on the extravagant price that you paid to purchase our salvation, and not just our forgiveness, but to purchase our righteousness. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.